That's certainly a far different sound than the music I heard as a Kiowa youth. But those rock and roll musicians and the Quacutal dancers filmed some 50 years ago have something in common with me, our Native American heritage, our Indianness. And that's why it's important to me to give you some information concerning that heritage. Three tiny ships, exactly like these, helped change life in America by bringing 104 colonists to Jamestown, Virginia in 1607. Those settlers formed the first successful English colony in the New World. But in reality, it was not a new world, nor was it unsettled. We are told that Columbus discovered America in 1492. The truth is, Indians discovered America thousands of years before Columbus. Before the colonists built Jamestown, cultural developments were taking place on both sides of the Atlantic. Even as great cities were springing up in Europe, Native Americans were also building cities and making scientific discoveries on this side of the ocean. Both before and after European colonization, Indians have had a major impact on the total development of the United States. That impact is more than painted horsemen attacking a stagecoach, more than bows and arrows. The most profound impact of the American Indian on the development of our nation is reflected in our very form of government. The distinctive political ideals of American life emerged from a rich Indian democratic tradition. That tradition can be traced to documents here in the National Archives. Universal suffrage for women, the pattern of states within a state, the tradition of treating chiefs as servants of the people instead of their masters, the demand that the community respect the diversity of men and their dreams. All of these things were part of the American way of life long before the arrival of Columbus. The first regional democratic governing body in what is now the United States was not the Continental Congress, which met at Independence Hall in Philadelphia. Even the Virginia Colonial Assembly, meeting here in Williamsburg, was a latecomer in the field of representative government. The first was an organization known as the League of Five Nations, or the Iroquois League. It was established sometime prior to 1600 to unite five Iroquois nations in order to solve mutual problems. This Iroquois beaded belt tells the story of the member nations uniting. They adopted an oral constitution and a governing council of 50 representatives. The council dealt with items affecting the entire group, but left purely tribal matters up to each individual Iroquois nation. The original five were the Onondaga, depicted in a Turtle Clan meeting here, the Seneca, Cayuga, Oneida, and Mohawk nations. 104 years after its formation, the League added a sixth nation, the Tuscarora. Women had a strong voice in the Iroquois society. The clan mother selected the chiefs and was the most powerful figure in a strong local form of government. Iroquois women owned the family crops and houses and had voting rights. Although outnumbered by rival Algonquian tribes, the Iroquois became the dominant force in the Northeast following the formation of the Iroquois League. That league continues to operate today. Artist Oren Lyons is a subchief in the Turtle Clan in the Onondaga Nation. He teaches Native American studies at Buffalo University. The Onondaga chief says the U.S. governmental ideals can be traced to the Iroquois League. Prior to drawing up his Albany Plan of Union for the colonies in 1754, Benjamin Franklin requested a meeting with the Iroquois League chiefs to learn more about the Indian Confederacy. Chief Lyons recounts the substance of the meeting between colonial leaders and the Iroquois chiefs. And it was suggested at that time by an Onondaga chief that they, the colonies, unite uh, in a form of government that was similar to ours, that would uh, represent the people. The format is very ancient, and this is the format that was taken by the 13 colonies originally, the Articles of Confederation. There is ample evidence that Franklin was influenced by the Iroquois Confederacy when he did draw up the Albany Plan. 
Moreover, that plan was followed essentially more than 20 years later in the Articles of Confederation, the forerunner of the United States Constitution. Ben Franklin put it this way in his argument for colonial union. It would be a very strange thing if six nations of ignorant savages should be capable of forming a scheme for a union, and yet that a like union should be impracticable for ten or a dozen English colonies to whom it is more necessary. In addition to Franklin, Thomas Jefferson and George Washington were familiar with the Iroquois League. The founders of our nation were facing the problem of uniting sovereign states when they wrote the United States Constitution. And they did adopt ideas from the Iroquois League. Well, immediately, always they were warned. Ray Fadden, a Mohawk, is curator of the Six Nations Museum in Anchiota, New York. An expert on the Iroquois Confederacy, Fadden says our form of government was not born from European ideals. Over here in America, those chiefs were representatives, something like Congress, I suppose. They simply represented their clans, and since everyone belonged to a clan, in plain English, they represented their people, were put in office by their people to represent them in their government. Even today in Washington, D.C., impact is being felt from Indian governmental bodies. The Navajo Reservation headquarters at Window Rock, Arizona, is the seat of one tribal government whose actions have set off waves of reaction in the national capital. Four times a year, the Navajo Tribal Council is called into session by the council chairman. Members are the elected representatives of the largest Indian nation in the United States. On a December day in 1888, two cowboys looking for stray cattle atop a Colorado mesa became the first non-Indians to view this site. Cliff Palace, a cliff dwelling at Mesa Verde, is just one of a number of construction feats accomplished nearly a thousand years ago by some amazing Indian people. Their impact on the architecture and urban development of the Southwest is immeasurable. Anthropologists call the people who built the cliff houses members of the Anasazi culture. The culture appeared about the time of Christ. At first, the Anasazi lived in caves, giving no hint of their future architectural brilliance. Corn was their only crop. By 450 AD, the Anasazi began creating permanent housing. The pit house featured the first crude basements in the United States. Four corner posts provided support for the walls and roof, which were lacings of sticks and brush covered with thick adobe mud. In addition to developing permanent houses, the people learned to make pottery. The turkey was domesticated and beans were added to their corn crops. The Anasazi Pueblo period began developing about 750 AD. Arts and crafts flourished, trade began. Cotton was introduced and the bow and arrow became a hunting tool and a weapon.